Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economies interview series. Um, I am really, really pleased this time and, and quite privileged to bring you a relatively new voice to the, uh, the study of Cuba, its constitution, its culture, and its economy. Uh, and it is my great pleasure today to interview Nufsan Bui, uh, who comes to us from Hong Kong. Um, professor um, Nuf is an assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law, where he teaches and researches on constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and comparative law. His work includes monographs, The Constitutional Change in the Contemporary Socialist World, which was uh, just published by Oxford University Press in 2020, congratulations, um, and Confucian Constitutionalism in East Asia, which is a Rutledge publication in 2016, and uh, various articles, really, really a nice collection of articles um, published in the American Journal of Comparative Law, the International Journal of Constitutional Law, Cornell's International Law Journal, NYU's Journal of International Law and Politics, the Illinois Law Review, among others. Uh, he was previously a research fellow at the Center for Asian Legal Studies in the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law, and he serves as an editor of the Asian Journal of Comparative Law. He earned his PhD at the University of Hong Kong and the LLM and LLB degrees at Vietnam National University in Hanoi. He's been an academic uh, visitor at Melbourne Law School, uh, a visiting scholar at Tsinghua Law School, and a visiting researcher at uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, today, we will speak with uh, Professor Nerf about his fascinating work on Cuban constitutionalism and, interestingly enough, picking up a uh, a strand of the conversation we had in our recent interview with uh, Jorge Dominguez on its connection with emerging trends in global and internationalist constitutionalism. And for that reason alone, besides the power of his work, we are delighted to, uh, to have you with us. So welcome. And I wanted to start by asking you about your trip to Cuba, in a sense, where did all of this come from? This trip to Cuba, what you learned, and how it contributed to your scholarship. So welcome, and it's all yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Larry Becker, for inviting me to this uh, um, interview. So I went to Cuba in uh, 2019, just, just shortly after Cuban adopted the new constitution, just a few months after that. And my research, I, that process of making that constitution is fascinating. And you and your college also produced two uh, very important articles in about, about that uh, process. And I want to really want to come there to learn about and to see the country and to, to, to talk to the people there about the new constitution. And um, so during that uh, visit uh, to Cuba, I, I visit um, the, the Cuban uh, International Association of Lawyers. And I met with uh, one scholar of uh, international law there. And then I visited uh, the law school in Havana University. And uh, a professor there, a constitutional law professor that gave me a very intensive lecture about the important things, uh, new development in Cuba constitution. And I also had a chance to, to talk to local people, how they think about the, 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 the constitution. Um, so for example, many people told me that uh, they're really excited about the new provision about uh, private property or something like, like that. So I, um, um, I uh, after the visit, I, I think I, I need to do two things about Cuban constitution. One is uh, about the internal process and uh, the national dimensions of the constitution that, that I incorporate that uh, research into my, the chapter in my book. And after that chapter, I think there are some very important like international dimensions in the constitution. And by that, I decided to wrote to, to write an article. Uh, this is the, the article on 
the international dimension of uh, Cuba's constitution. That is the subject for, for, for our uh, discussion uh, today. All right, beautiful. And, and by the way, to our listeners, um, I will make the, um, both the, the name and the citation of the article available for those of you who want to read it more in depth. It is an extraordinarily rich article uh, lots and lots of meat there to uh, to chew up bone. Sorry, my, my metaphors are just getting worse and worse. A lot of meat to eat or bone to chew on, I guess. Um, and, and it really is worth uh, the time to read about it. So let me ask you a couple of questions about, uh, about the book, if I can, uh, about the article. Yeah. You speak about the constitutional enshrinement of international relations, which I found fascinating. Uh, and yet it manifests itself in a quite unique way in the Cuban constitutional discourse. And I'm particularly curious about the way in which you look at that enshrinement of international relations within the context of, of Cuba and in the principles that you identify, international amity, independismo, anti-imperialism and the like. Because in a sense, when you look at Cuban internationalism in its constitution, it looks at least to some people's eyes as somewhat deeply embedded in the national and historical context of Cuba and therefore would be very different, for example, from Vietnamese internationalism or Chinese internationalism in their constitution. So I was wondering if you could explain uh, what's unique in this respect in Cuban constitutionalism and how it kind of either aligns or supplements or adds to uh, the, the similar impulses elsewhere? Yeah, uh, thank you for this uh, very great question. Uh, uh, this unique in two things. One is the form and another one is the substance of uh, that uh, principles of international relation. In the form, for example, the U.S., you cannot see any term about foreign affairs in U.S. Constitution, even though the Constitution also has significant international significance. Uh, many other constitutions, they also have provision about international relationship. Vietnam, for example, they have one article about the country's policy in uh, international affairs. But Cuba is unique in terms of um, having a long chapter, a single and long chapter on international relations in the constitution. And in that chapter, they have like 40 articles, very long articles about the principles of international relations. This is quite, so the Cuban uh, constitution makers tech international relations very seriously, and they put that into uh, the constitution. I didn't see any other, from my limited uh, knowledge, I, I don't see any other countries that have a very long statements about international relations in the constitution like that. That is the form, it's uniform. Let's turn to the substance, um, the unique thing about the substantive contents of that principle is the combination between pragmatism and principles. And pragmatism is informed by, as you said, unique, distinctive Cuban historical uh, legacy. Uh, for example, even though Cuba, uh, in one of the principles is that Cuba want to be uh, friend, friends with every country in the world. This is internationalism. But at the same time, uh, there are some other principles which are specifically informed by Cuban unique history. For example, uh, the principle of uh, independence. This principle is informed by the legacy of Spanish uh, colonialism in, in, in Cuba and also informed by uh, the American intervention in, in, in Cuba. And with that historical background, the Cuban people, the Cuban constitution maker take national sovereignty very seriously and they put that concern into the constitution. Another unique thing is about the relationship between Cuba and Latin American countries. Even though they said that they open up to every country, but they also want to maintain 
a special connection with Latin American countries. So with that, uh, because of the location of the country and the historical connection between Cuba and also Latin American countries like Venezuela. So in the, with that historical connection, so they put into the constitution, the principles of Latin Americanism, saying that Cuba remain specific, a special relationship with Latin American countries. Another unique thing is uh, Cuba's relationship with socialist countries uh, like Vietnam and China. So now we have only, so after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we only have five socialist countries in the world, uh, China, Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea, and Laos. And then because Cuba is a socialist country, they still remain, uh, they, they committed to like internationalism, but they still remain a special relationship with socialist countries like, uh, like China or Vietnam. So with that, we can see the combination between pragmatism, open up to the all world, and so also pragmatism uh, uh, principles. The fact that uh, the Cuban uh, constitution makers put these principles into the constitution uh, suggests that they, they consider this is not like a government policy of uh, international relation. They consider this principle as foundational is foundational because that their constitutionalization, they consider this principle is foundational for Cuba's long-term engagement with uh, the world. Okay, and therefore a constraint on the government's ability to deviate from that line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 okay. Yeah, because of that constitutionalization. Okay. All right. So, uh, a couple of questions, if I can follow up. This is yeah. this is actually quite fascinating. So, you have Latin American, uh, Latin Americanism, um, mm -hmm. and you have uh, notions of regional integration. And of course, there there is, as you suggest, a very long history of that uh, of that tendency, which isn't ideologically based on on socialists, on socialism, but is certainly endemic to the history of Latin America and its relations to the old Spanish empire and the Americans. But I'm wondering, is there an analog of that kind of impulse of regional integration, uh, for example, in Southeast Asia? Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Vietnam and Laos, two uh, brother, sister, uh, socialist countries, but Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand. Is there any sense, any analogous sense of this kind of regional internationalism outside of the, the Cuban sphere, or is that something that's fairly unique? Yeah, it's an interesting question. To take Vietnam as an example, according to, um, so before we, the country opened up, in the late uh, uh, 20th century, uh, the constitution in uh, 1980, uh, 1980, for example, they also had a provision that uh, Vietnam maintained a relationship with uh, socialist countries. Mm. But after the open, uh, that after the country opened up, they delete that provision, and now mm. only internationalism saying that Vietnam want to establish a friendly relationship with any countries in the world, regardless of their political and social uh, differences. Even though Vietnam also a socialist country and also a member of the ASEAN, but the, we don't see any provision in the constitution about that uh, regionalism um, in, in the constitution. So the main difference is that uh, Vietnam open up is more comprehensive uh, compared with uh, um, Cuba. Okay, all right. Yeah. And, and, and actually you, you anticipated another follow-up question because one of them is, well, you've got regionalism that may or may not have anything to do with the ideological posture of the regional countries. Um, yeah. But then the second question is of course, because of the nature of, of, uh, of communism um, yeah. and its history, um, there had been for a long time the development, as, as, as you mentioned, 
of course, but what I would call uh, communist internationalism, the old common turn before the, uh, the Second World War, and then the new communist international. Um, and there's a sense that, uh, that the Cuban constitution to some extent continues at least in some form, this notion of, frat of communist fraternity uh, and privileges it in ways that maybe, as you mentioned, the Vietnam no longer does, at least officially. Um, do you see that as a difference or is that something that, that uh, has no longer relevant? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, as you mentioned in, in your article uh, about Cuban's constitutional law, Cuban constitutional development is still strongly informed by the achievement during the revolutionary period. Cuban uh, revolution led by uh, President uh, Fidel Castro. And after that revolution, uh, the social, economic, and political system in Cuba seem to be more stable. Vietnam is, is a different. Vietnam is di different, uh, the countries. So after uh, the revolution to overturn uh, French uh, colonialism, so the country engaged in two other wars with uh, French and then America. Uh, so the North follow um, like socialist system and the South follow like um, the capitalist system. The government system is different. So only after unification in uh, so that we, we have like a unified a political system informed by Marxism and, and Leninism. But when we unify the country, um, we also very internationalist, open up the country uh, to, to different countries in the world. So the founding, uh, the founding ideological uh, commitments to socialism still there. We also, similar to Cuban constitution, we also have the provision in the constitution saying that uh, Marxism and Leninism is the leading ideology of the Communist Party. Um, but um, because of uh, comprehensive internationalism, um, the commitment, there's a different uh, dimensions compared with uh, uh, Cuban in, in, in this um, uh, sense. I mean, Vietnamese internationalism is more comprehensive than Cuba. One specific uh, example is recently, uh, just last, just, just this year, um, uh, there's the EU and Vietnam uh, very comprehensive free trade agreement. Oh. So in this sense, the country is the second free trade agreement uh, the EU side with um, a Southeast Asian country after Singapore. And this is the most comprehensive free trade agreement uh, that the EU ever signed with a developing country. This is the signal of Vietnamese uh, internationalism. That's right. But and also in, in that context, um, Vietnam has significantly more economic muscle right yeah. now than, than Cuba does. And you've got well over what, like 120 million people um, in, in the population of Vietnam, which is significantly more than I guess the 11 million people that, that um, are, that is the population of Cuba. Um, but still um, you're, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. The nature of the internationalism is quite different in yeah. places like Vietnam than, than it is in Cuba. And that in, in, in that case, uh, context really matters and it's managed to survive within the formal structures of the, the Cuban constitution itself. Now, here's the question. Do the provisions, the internationalist provisions in the constitutions of Cuba as well as Vietnam, and the answer may be different, depending on which one you're looking at, do they also bind and become part of the basic line of the Cuban and or the Vietnamese Communist Party? That is, is the party and the party leadership also bound by the internationalist principles within the constitution? Um, yeah, this, uh, because, um, 
I again I agree with your your argument. They also buy both the party and the government because the Communist Party, similar to Communist Party in in Cuba or Vietnam, they are not separate from the state. They are an internal part of the polity, according to your theory. So normally the party will decide that um, the basic or fundamental principles of uh, any important policy. Even so the incorporation of that international principles into the constitution is not merely decided by the state. These are also decided, it's basically decided by the Communist Party. The part you can only incorporate that into the constitution if the party agree agreed for you to do so. Okay, so in this sense, the party is also under uh, the scope of that principle. Okay, and that makes sense because, in a sense, then in both constitutions, these provisions are both ideological and normative. They yeah, they yeah. represent okay. They represent both the the will of the of the political the holders of political power as well as mm -hmm. the uh, a popular power represented in the constitution itself. All right, excellent, yeah. excellent. All right, very interesting. All right, let me move on a little bit to another part of the article, which I found just fascinating. Uh, and for me, one of the most interesting aspects of the article touches on the enshrinement of constitutional internationalism in the form of human rights, climate change, and for me, most crucially, in the context of foreign investment which raised uh, uh, quite a number of eyebrows, at least on this side of the world. And I was wondering if you could elaborate the arguments that you made uh, in your article about this uh, constitutional internationalism in the context of human rights, climate change, and foreign investment. Yeah, yeah. So that's a three news uh, development, uh, three news developments in the, the constitution is fascinating. And I am in the article. I try to to uh, explain um, why they incorporate that provisions into the constitution, and I also try to anticipate uh, like the future uh, effects of that provisions in Cuba uh, constitutional politics and law. Human rights, for example, this is quite important. Um, three things about human rights. First. The constitution has a new provision about human dignity. You didn't see that in the, the, in the previous constitution. Uh, they, they consider human dignity is supreme uh, value of um, human being. Second, they exactly use the term human rights. And this is the first time the term human rights appeared in Cuban constitution. Uh, this is the, the, the ideological dimension. In terms of spe specific rights, that in compare with the previous constitution, uh, the new constitution has new, like 10 new rights, including the right to life and right to um, pri pri private uh, privacy and the right to marriage. So the, the new right. So the thing is why they have that new development. One, one reason is because of uh, new vision about international law, human rights law under the new leadership uh, role uh, Castro, which is different from, from uh, President Fidel Castro. So in 2008, uh, under the new leadership, Cuba signed two important international human rights documents on political rights, and then another one on social and economic rights. So the, uh, the ratification of new human rights treaties um, provides the condition or uh, incentive for local uh, maker or constitution maker to constitutionalize international human rights commitment. Another reason is because of um, foreign governments and international organizations like Human Rights Watch they criticized human rights situation in, in Cuba. So Cuba incorporate human rights in order to send a strong signal opposition to the outside world that no, we respect human rights. So this have the signal function. 
this is uh, my explanation about the human rights provision. Climate change is quite another uh, important uh, development. Uh, I think Cuba is the last country in the world to have uh, a climate change clause in the constitution. Before Cuba, there are, there are like 10 other countries and Cuba may be the 11th country to have that uh, clause in the constitution, which recognize the danger of climate change to human beings. Uh, so why Cuba incorporate that uh, uh, one into the constitution? One is because of uh, the local condition. Cuba was also affected by climate change. So there are storms uh, affect both uh, sides in Cuba and also in Florida. Cuba suffered that effect of climate change. So they incorporate that into the constitution um, to um, basically that provision, I think has three functions. One is to send a signal to uh, the community, the global community that Cuba shared the same concern with the global community in terms of human uh, of, uh, environmental protection. The second thing is that that provision provides the base for Cuba to implement their uh, international uh, environmental commitment in domestic law. And finally, um, that may provide the base for the engagement uh, with other countries like the US because uh, Hanava and Florida was both affected by climate change. Uh, the storm, for example, in 2000, I think 2017, uh, the big uh, hurricane, uh, hurricanes, they also Hurricane. affect yeah, yeah. The hurricanes, both sides of uh, the countries. So I think that may be the, the base for, for the two countries to engage uh, in dealing with uh, the effect of climate change. Uh, finally, uh, in the article, I also discussed foreign investment. This is quite new uh, development. It's quite unusual development for Cuba uh, because they are committed to reservation of socialism at the same time, and then to open up to a capitalist investment in another side. This is quite, quite, quite unusual uh, for, for um, uh, this is quite new development uh, um, for, 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 for Cuba. And apart from that, the new constitution also has a provision protecting private ownership in this sense, uh, that provision can open up the country. This is send a signal to, to the outside world that we are going to, in, to open up. As you also mentioned on your uh, scholarship that Cuba also uh, had a, a law, a foreign investment law before this constitution. So mm -hmm. one, you may question that this is not just uh, it's a new development, it's just like constitutionalized the pre-exiting uh, practice. I don't think so. Um, the two important functions of this provision here. One is that um, when you constitutionalize uh, that practice, you send a strong signal to the um, very strong, very authoritative signal to the outside world that we are open up. And another thing is that uh, within that uh, new provision, uh, Cuba lawmaker, they will uh, amend uh, the investment law. During my interview, uh, so one Cuban uh, person, a lawyer also told me that the country's plan to, to revise the, the new uh, investment law according to the new constitution. Actually, they, they plan to, to uh, revise or uh, in that around more than uh, 70 new laws, including the law on uh, foreign uh, investments. Huh. That is my explanation about internationalism in Cuba. Okay. So did you, the, the, <laughs> your, your discussion is really rich and I'm, I'm just, I'm eager to ask you a million questions, but let me ask you just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, one of them is you, you've mentioned now several times that one of the critical functions of these provisions, uh, human rights, uh, climate change and foreign investment is signaling. Yeah. And the signaling is an outward signaling. You're signaling to the international human rights 
uh, organizations and community. You're signaling to uh, people and states who are worried about climate change. Uh, you're signaling to the, uh, the international economic community uh, and its various actors that, that fall within the, the Cuban 2030 plan. Um, these outward signals are interesting, but might the Constitution also have been signaling inward uh, to the Cuban people with respect to what they ought to be able to expect from their government as well with respect to each of these things? Yeah, I agree. They have the, the signal to both the domestic and international audience. Um, yeah, I also in, in my chapter for the book, which uh, do uh, studies the domestic dimension, I also say, argue that they also signal to the local Cuban people that uh, the country, uh, because local dissidents, for example, they also criticize human rights situation uh, in the country, so they also signal to the local people. So the signaling function is here, it's both um, national and uh, international, similar to the whole process of the constitution. They have both national and, and, and uh, international. Okay. Um, um, but for, for, for me, these provisions, human rights, climate change, and foreign investment, uh, it's quite unique in the sense that it's just a, it sends strong signal, both positive and negative signal to the outside world. It's not only talk to the Cuban people. And this is why the, my, 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 the title of my article is you the people, it's not only we the people. Yeah, 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 but yeah. of course they talk to both we the people and you the people. Okay, now one of the questions I have, and, and this always comes up, uh, for me, when, when I look at human rights, for example, from a Chinese uh, perspective, um, I've, I've noticed that, that there are many instances where, for example, uh, Chinese and American officials or Chinese and European officials will use the same words, but they will convey very different meanings because of the fundamental ideological positions from which each of the speakers are talking. And so I'm wondering if um, in the context of the human rights provisions of the Cuban constitution, we might also be seeing this as well. So for example, um, it, and, and I thought, well, okay, that may be the case uh, because as, uh, as Marxist Leninist countries, uh, they would be centering the collective uh, over the individual, the individual as a function of the, of the collective, uh, the, the whole uh, very elaborate and very complex Chinese approach to the individuals embedded within the larger society and, and all of that. But then you brought me up short because you can't make that analogy in Cuba since the, the Cubans have also enshrined the notion of individual human dignity. Right, which is the the old uh, the uh, you know if, if you want one of the ways you can trace it back is to the Article One of the German Basic Law, which centers on the individual, and so then my question is well, beyond the signaling, how are the have the Cubans given any indication uh, to you about how they plan to actually elaborate and implement? these constitutional guarantees, especially with respect to human rights internally in the country, especially given their history with respect to, um, to political dissent? Yeah, uh, this is a very interesting question. And uh, um, yeah, of course, um, they, they may use the similar terms, but uh, they with different meanings. Um, uh, socialist understanding about fundamental rights are more statist, communitarian. Uh, rights must be balanced with uh, duties and they favor more like social and economic rights over political rights. Uh, that is the top-down ideology or the state ideology. But the thing is that um, this is my argument. The thing is that when you put a human rights commitments into the constitution, uh, it's not easy for the state to singly dominate human rights discourse. 
to dominate the meaning of human rights, the meaning of your, your interpretation of human rights meaning. Especially in the countries like China, Vietnam, and Cuba, especially in countries like Cuba, like Vietnam, the society is more pluralist. You cannot control the meaning of human rights because of uh, internet, diffusion of ideas outside, uh, traveling, uh, you open up the country. So you have young people, they, have, they acquire more universalist understanding about human rights. And they use that understanding. New lawyers, young lawyers, dissidents, or local NGOs, they have different understanding about human rights according to more universalist standard rather than status uh, ideology. And with that, they will mobilize for the implementation of human rights according to the new constitution and according to that universalist uh, understanding. I just give you one example in Vietnam. Vietnam also has a new, the new constitution in Vietnam in 2013, also had a new provision on the right to life. And Vietnam also, the government also still remain a communitarian understanding about human rights. But local law, the lawyers, activists, local activists, they adopt more universalist understanding about the right, to, the, the human right to life. And they demand the government to revise the criminal law to abolish that penalty. Oh. Because that provision is not consistent with the right to life in the constitution. In response, uh, the parliament, they did not delete entirely that penalty, but they delete the application of that penalty to, to seven offense, criminal offense. They did not apply to seven people. They selectively delete that application. So this is one example of how um, human rights work into, in, 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 in uh, countries. The important thing I want to emphasize that um, different from America, so we don't have judicial review um, in, in social countries. So um, courts are not the main actors to implement human rights, but the legislators, is the main is the parliament will be the main forum to 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 implement constitutional rights commitment. Okay. Uh, so activists, local lawyers, and society they will uh, suggest the parliament to amend the law according to the new constitution. So this is the how human rights uh, work. Um, in, in, in countries like Cuba, uh, in Vietnam. And I can anticipate that when Cuba become more and more internationalized, open up to the country, open up the economy, the countries be will become more pluralist. Uh, lawyers, the lawyer, local lawyers, they, they will adopt more plural, uh, liberal uh, understanding about human rights. And they may uh, mobilize for constitutional rights uh, implementation in the same in the same way yeah All right. well that yeah. uh, i mean if if what you say is true that represents a tremendous gamble on the part of the cuban communist party um, because mm. it suggests that the method by which they've been keeping control the old traditional uh kind of soviet style top down not the asian style but the the european style Leninist system of top down is now likely to be challenged within the system rather yeah. than um, to use the Chinese expression from the black hand of foreign interference. Mm -hmm. uh, and that for a party that is very used to dominating and controlling everything from the first secretary of the party down through the party apparatus. Now all of a sudden you're suggesting another venue Mm. where a discussion will be have, had in the legislature. 
Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see how the, the, the party actually reacts to the possibilities of pluralism within, within the governmental system that they themselves have created. Um, yeah. It can go either very well or it can go very badly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're, yeah. We're, we're, we're just not, not sure. Um, last question on this, although I can spend three hours on this, uh, but I don't, I don't want to um, overextend my, my welcome here in the interview. Um, with respect to uh, uh, climate change, to what extent has Cuba limited its ability to engage with other countries on climate change by having constitutionalized the objective uh, in, in, in the form in which they, they've adopted it. Is this uh, from the from a constitutional perspective, does this over limit the ability of the government to be flexible or is this a good thing? Uh, I think this is a good thing because the provision in, uh, in the constitution is not specific. It's very general. Uh, it just said that the uh, Cuban recognized the, the threat of climate change to human being. And they, they just said that, that they committed, committed to work with uh, the human, the global community to deal with that uh, climate change. So this is very general. Uh, so it's open a very uh, a general framework for, for Cuban to engage with um, maybe foreign countries and also international uh, bodies to in this one so they okay. then, because this is the principle it's not a policy so it's very uh foundational and and general all right but but here let me follow up on that um and this is where i was i was coming from so they adopt the provision yeah. that effectively prioritizes climate change they do this after the party has adopted the 2030 the, their their uh, ten year plan, their ten year yeah. economic plan, right? And all Marxist Leninist countries will have one of these plans. The plan did not prioritize climate change in the way in which uh, the party and the state apparatus were meant to review applications for either foreign investment or for national development along the priority lines, uh, infrastructure, tourism, pharma. Would the imposition of this new climate change provision now work to effectively reform something like the 2030 plan so that officials would have to somehow figure out how to incorporate climate positive factors in the way in which they implement the um, economic goals that were set out in this plan. Is it gonna be that far reaching or is it still more just principle that won't have an application? So before the incorporation of that climate change provision, Cuban government already had some uh, policies to deal with uh, climate change. So I think the new provision will be the base for the government to further, further uh, revise the law and policy in that one. And um, because the incorporation is very general, I don't see they, they, they have a priority on that issue, but it's just like a general principle. They can incorporate in the, the country's uh, national and economic development uh, later, but th this is the very uh, general. Even the plan and the, the economic, social and economic, economic plan is also very flexible. So they, they, I think they can incorporate in, into that one in, in the future. Okay, okay, but it is possible and it may be- It is possible. At, it's at, it's okay. no constitutional difficulty for, for, for that one. Okay, including potentially radical changes in the way in which they administer uh, their macroeconomic planning. Yeah, and the thing is that because the constitution is the most important legal document. If they put that commitment into the constitution, they, they consider that is very seriously. 
that that issue, climate change issue, very very seriously, and then we're committed to deal with that in a very um, like serious way. And I believe that in the future they will inform local policy and and and, and, and law. Okay, it and would be very law. curious. Yeah, <laughs> the reason the reason we I have to wait. wait. We yeah, had to I, wait because the constitution just uh, passed uh, last year, so we had to wait. Right. Well, I, I actually had a, a naughty, naughty ulterior motive in asking the question, uh, yeah. and that is, of course, the um, uh, as as we understand it, the um, the party congress will be meeting in April again. Yeah. And it would be very curious to see if the party adopted or uh, adopted changes or reforms in their 2030 plan. Uh, based on, uh, for example, climate change, they're requiring the state apparatus now to revise it in light of the need to prioritize. This is one of those areas where, aha, now we've got a new constitution. The party is about to meet in its Congress. Now you've got the space where you can actually use the constitution to affect the application of party ideology based on its um, its expression in the Constitution to to uh, to create fairly fundamental economic changes as well probably won't happen. But it's it's interesting with this internationalist signaling, the both internal and external signaling. You you really set it up so that that possibility now becomes much more real than it would have been a year ago or a year and a half yeah. ago. I also look uh, hope to, to visit Cuba again uh, to follow up how they implement the new uh, constitutional commitments in their plan of law reform. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you'll have to tell me when you go because I want to go with you. This this would be a okay. lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Let me let me um, go to my my last set of questions. I was particularly struck by your discussion on the constitutionalization of transnationalism respecting dual citizens and foreigner rights. Um, that, that, that actually really resonated with me. And I was curious about the differences uh, between Cuban and the Vietnamese positions on each of these issues. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, this is the, the dual citizenship is a new development in Cuba. Um, uh, this allow like, uh, is saying that uh, when you have another citizenship, it doesn't mean you lost Cuban citizenship. Uh, this is a new development. It's also important issue during constitution making process. And uh, the, the difference with Vietnam for, is that uh, Vietnam doesn't have dual citizenship. And uh, this is the difference. Uh, another thing about the right of uh, foreigners, uh, you can sit for assembly, assembly uh, in, 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 in Vietnam. But the thing is that uh, Cuban is, uh, both countries have that provision. For political reasons, you can come and the, the state can grant uh, the asylum uh, for you. The thing is that Cuban specified in the constitution, the reasons they, they will grant that right to the people who uh, struggle for socialism and who struggle to against imperialism and colonialism. So that, that, that provision is not only to, to, to uh, the people who want to come to the country, but it sent an ideological signal uh, to the outside world that I support socialism. I don't agree with uh, colonialism. I this uh, I oppose um, um, imperialism. Uh, so, so that provision is not uh, about the right, but also an instrument for the Cuban government to signal their uh, ideological commitment. So. Uh, this is the, the difference between, uh, and this connected to our very first question about uh, the constitutionalizations of uh, anti-imperialism and uh, internationalism and socialism in, in, in Cuban's uh, uh, constitution. All right, Th this is actually fascinating. As you were talking, I was thinking, oh my God, 
Mm. It reminds me of a little bit, there's, there's a whiff, a historical whiff here of yeah. uh, Fidel's actions in during the, the course of the second Havana declaration where there were a bunch of foreigners in who were uh, supporting, I'm translating it in, from the Spanish in my head, but who were supporting the, the government uh, out in the square. And he comes out and he says, yes, you're all part of the, the mass of people. We, we bring all of you in who support socialism. And so you can be part of this popular demonstration uh, mm -hmm. that will then direct the government. And in a sense, what if, if one looks carefully, it might even be possible. Now I'm curious enough to, to take a look. You can almost connect the dots mm -hmm. back to that revolutionary moment occurring, I think it was 1962 or 1963, and then essentially forgotten. And now it's aroma, like the ghost mm -hmm. of this old practice now appears and not in this kind of flamboyant way with uh, half a million people sitting in a square or a million people sitting in a square, but now institutionalized in a very bureaucratic way within yeah. the confines of a, of a written constitution, which, which is kind of interesting, uh, yeah. especially if, if it yeah, ultimately is, does something. Yeah, this is very uh, interesting historical um, no, reason. And I should incorporate uh, in that one in, in, into my discussion of this uh, uh, article. This is quite in interesting. And this also consistent with uh, your two articles about um, uh, Cuban participatory constitution making. And you trace that uh, participation back to a long history in Cuban uh, revolution. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the problem. <laughs> That's part of the problem of, of having lived longer is that yeah. your, your memory extends much longer and, and, and sometimes you connect dots and sometimes the dots don't exist. So it's always yeah. good to test these ideas to see yeah. if, if when I, actually yeah, When I discuss the dual citizenship, I also connect to that uh, historical reason, but not in a very strong way. Uh, one of the reasons I explain why Cuban uh, constitution maker are garbage Due citizenship is to create uh, national identity. Um, even though you are foreigners, you got new citizenship in, in other countries, you're still a member of the Cuban community. You share with the Cuban community the same uh, culture uh, and, and historical background. So I think one of the functions of this provision is to, to create or to maintain uh, national uh, identity. Okay, and that's mm -hmm. that's in a way similar to what um, what one sees around the Chinese constitution as well. Mm -hmm. The notion that uh, one can change nationality in a sense, but one always retains the 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 nation the connection to the um, the the old homeland, um, and that that applies, I think, more to expatriate Chinese than it does to, uh, um, to foreigners who come into China. But there's, there's, there's a little bit of that uh, as well, um, yeah. which, which I found just, just very interesting um, in that context. Um, last questions, last, yeah. last points. Um, when you put all of this together, uh, because in a sense, this, this is in, in a lot of ways, when you add all of these things up, you have a number of provisions in the Cuban constitution, which are actually quite new and distinctive. Um, yeah. To what extent does the internationalization of the constitutional document in a country like Cuba also permit popular re reference or popular recourse to international instruments directly to then affect the way in which the internationalized constitution is interpreted. That is having opened the door to internationalization, having said we're now, this is deeply embedded in all of these different flows, and we have regionalism. We uh, we understand the 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 narratives 
and the imperatives, the international imperatives of climate change, of human rights, um, the, the notions of foreigners embedding in the system and all of that, um, much of it with its genesis in international uh, instruments, not just treaties, but declarations and principles, does this open the door for Cuban citizens beyond the party, those who are interpreting the constitution to then say, aha, we can now with this internationalist constitution go outside of the nation and outside of the documents of the nation to find sources of interpretation in those areas of our constitution itself. Yeah, so uh, this is a very big question, but I, I just begin with uh, some very specific uh, stories when I visited Havana. So one, one, one person in Cuba I met, uh, she told, he told me that he's going to open uh, um, a new company uh, to, to cooperate with um, his friends in China to open a new company. He's already prepared to open a company uh, according to the new provision uh, about foreign investment and private ownership. This is one example. And recently he sent me uh, a, a message saying that I'm going to, 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 to China and to see uh, after the COVID-19, I will visit China. This is an example of how, how they affect the new provision inform uh, the people life and affect their consideration of uh, business and foreign investment. Uh, my personal experience in, in Cuba is like the hotel. The hotel I stay is the, like a joint venture between the state uh, company and another uh, foreign company. So you, you see the international things in, even within the hotel, you can see that one, that, that the international things. And when I, I went to um, some shops and I, I, I listened to, to uh, I like Latin American music, right? So people now enjoy Latin American uh, music. Um, so with that current experience, I think uh, uh, the new uh, uh, development, the new internationalized uh, provisions will change um, the people life in Cuba. Um, the right to the movement, the right to move, uh, the right to movement, for example. Current, uh, so before the new constitution, the Cuban uh, has a very restrictive uh, regulation about moving outside. But after the new constitution, some people anticipate that it's easier for you to go outside. And my friend said that he is going to visit in China. One is one example of how easy. Uh, the new provision will affect their their um, their their life. Yeah, so that okay. is some. Uh, I don't have a big theory about this uh, um, internationalization effect, but it's some specific uh, um, examples of how the law, the new constitution, uh, can change um, people's life. Right, right, and in that respect, I mean, and that makes perfect sense because it will be building on these small these mm. small steps, these little things that don't appear particularly significant that when mm. you aggregate them over time will probably have a significant effect, which mm. will then shape the, the, the discussion, the international discussion. So I, no, I get the point. And that, that makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. So I, I know I have taken up a tremendous amount of your time and I really appreciate your willingness to engage in what for me has been a fascinating discussion. So I wanted yeah, to thank you. I'm very happy to this uh, engagement. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity, last words, last thoughts that you might want to share with, with our listeners. Uh, Cuban is open up. The Cuban government is open. Cuba is open up uh, to both. Uh, I don't know the, the, the comprehensive, uh, uh, where the comprehensive or partial open up, but Cuba is with the new constitution. Cuba is now open up to their citizen and also open up to the outside world. And I look forward to that, um, the country's uh, opening. All right, beautiful. Well, 
Sir, thank you very, very much for an incredibly engaging and informative uh, conversation. Uh, for our listeners, I highly recommend the article. It is really worth uh, reading. You will get a lot out of it. Thank you so, so much for, um, for the conversation, and I hope that we will be able to do this again. Yeah, thank you, Professor Becker, for inviting me in this uh, interview again, and I really appreciate and enjoy the engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone.